Well, welcome to week two of 7134 EDN, making sense of education or learning and new technologies. And this week, the focus has been on systems thinking. Now, last week, we had a sort of an introduction to the course and looked at the range of research that supports educational technologies. Now we're starting to get into looking at some specific aspects of educational technology and trying to understand the complexities involved in any use of an educational technology. And one of the ways we can do that is through having a better understanding of the systems involved in any environment in which we use educational technologies. And to help us understand that in a little bit more detail, we're going to explore some systems theory which provides some tools and techniques for trying to understand systems in a little more detail than if we just tried to do so in the abstract. Yep. So how have we gone with looking at the material this week? Uh, I just, uh, I, I saw the PowerPoint yesterday. Uh, yeah, it's about the system thinking. I saw many dots and the lines connected with each other. It's mm -hmm. just like a very detailed plan for you to, to think about one thing uh, with all over uh, kind of point of view. It is, and you'll use a similar process when you come to analyze your particular um, work environment or the, the environment that you're going to try to create your implementation plan for, yep. uh, for developing um, the use of ICT and technology in a workplace or in a school or a particular environment and you'll create a system model for that. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually like the example of the, that bicycle. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it, 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 it's just a one problem, but it can reflect the other kinds of uh, aspects. And uh, it's a, it, a whole system. So I think it's uh, system thinking. It is. <laughs> it's a start to it, yes, absolutely. Sarah, how did you go? Yes, I have gone through the Uni3 Understanding Educational System and um, I have, um, I have, uh, what is that? A lot of uh, games there, I think. Um, uh, not so much games, but system models. Oh, uh, system models, sorry, not games, <laughs> system models, <laughs> yeah. There yeah. are games that, are, that do use system models, like SimCity and other mm -hmm. um, games that simulate a particular environment. Yeah, and uh, many of them are like, if you put, uh, a small example or small R numbers, but it will affect the whole system like that. Yes. Yeah. Um, primarily, we use system thinking to try to um, diverge our thinking. Um, a lot of other problem solving processes try to get us to um, refine mm -hmm. our thinking and narrow it down um, and yeah. come up with a very small set of concepts. That systems thinking is looking at looking outward and looking at all the complexities of other elements that affect what yep. we're trying to understand mm. and how they interrelate and affect each other. Yes. And Emma, I know is just catching up on some material. That's fine. But let's... Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. But I couldn't get couldn't find the URL link to the inside systems model. Okay, <laughs> yes. Question I one. <laughs> I did okay, notice a, 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 um, there's been a few changes to browsers now with uh, uh, Flash being not as strongly supported as it once was. And mm -hmm. you do need to sort of accept the use of Flash to show some of the models. And a couple of them mm -hmm. I didn't provide additional links. I will fix that up and make sure that those links are available. Um, okay. But you didn't need to look at all the examples. There was just a whole series yeah. of them so that you could just explore a few. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think what, some examples they are very interesting. Yeah, just to look at it. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's pop in. Unless Sarah, uh, let's Emma. You've got anything you want to add? Um, oh, I my only interest from only what I've my basic understanding of it from what I've picked up on is I find it interesting with my own situation being in a small country town and so many complexities come into mind when I think of my teaching practice. So that's how I'm sort of relating to it right now. No, absolutely, and you could even find yourself doing a systems model of the entire town with mm. all the different interrelating complexities of a small community. Yes. Um, but let's 
let me share the screen and we'll go and have a look at um, the PowerPoint um, display just to run through that quickly. Uh, okay, looks like I'll have to share it like this. Yes, you're seeing a good example of recursion. Okay, so you're all seeing the slideshow? Yep. Yeah. Okay, this is just a particular slideshow I use with um, a number of courses just to explain systems thinking. Um, so I'll just pop through some of the quotes. Uh, part of our new educational curriculum is um, the technologies learning area and it involves systems thinking um, along with a number of other thinking skills around computational thinking, design thinking, having a futures perspective and looking at strategic processes around project management and so forth. So this these concepts also fit within the Australian curriculum in a range of subject areas. Uh, systems thinking goes across a number of areas Particularly, it's one of the main organisers for the technologies learning area, but it's also used in areas of science and some of the other subject um, subjects and learning areas as well. One of the aspects we look at when we look at system thinking is we explore um, things from a, from a big picture perspective. So what are the <coughs> big things affecting society and education and so forth? And we try to identify things from a from an overarching view first, and then we slowly work out where our particular system fits within that. Now, I just saw that we had a someone wanting to get in on e uh, contacting and trying to get in, so I'm just going to pause for one second, see if I can assist them joining us. Um, so, oh, good. I see Damien has joined. Welcome, Damien. Uh, you're still muted just at the moment, Damien. Um, let me just... No, it's not muted. Oh, okay. Wonderful. Um, okay. Looks like Neo's having some difficulties. Uh, okay. One moment. I'll just send out the invites again and hopefully... Nia will be able to work that out. Okay, so we'll pop back to the slideshow then. And if you've got any questions, just ask them. Uh, I can't actually see you while I'm presenting. Okay, so other aspects of system thinking. So it allows us to analyze complex environments. And that's one of the biggest advantages of systems thinking in educational, research, educational technology research. Because anything involving human beings, and particularly with students in a classroom and so forth, it's a really complex environment to study. Um, and many more scientific approaches to researching and understanding that environment break down because of that complexity. But system thinking can help us by, instead of looking at the smaller and smaller bits of a particular system that which or environment that we're trying to understand, system thinking makes us look larger and larger. Now, part of this involves creating mental models. Um, now, you may have done some mental model work around concept maps and other sort of processes. But the idea is that in order to really understand a concept, we have to look more than just what's obvious. Um, so if we're looking at a, a classroom, for example, yes, there's obviously some students there and a teacher there and a classroom. But in order to really understand a, um, that environment, we have to go much 
further than just what we see. There's a whole lot of relationships that are built up over time. There's a particular attitude and sort of a whole lot of other aspects of that classroom that you won't just not won't just be able to analyze by a simple observation of a classroom. So same sort of concept around systems thinking. We develop a whole series of mental models that assist us to try to understand the world. And as we looked at last week at some of those epistemologies and worldviews, um, in some of them, particularly the realist one, we actually have a set worldview, but other, other particular perspectives is that we construct worldviews each individually. We have our own particular construction of reality. Um, and you can read through these quotes later on. But this is just some aspect around mental modeling if you want to get into that aspect. It's quite an important area for education because it helps explain the process of memory formation and how we have working memory and long-term memory and we take in images and auditory processes through our ears and we interpret those into particular uh, views of the world. But one of the things Albert Einstein was particularly famous for saying was that you can't understand a problem by working within the same problem. If you're just still thinking about at that level, you'll never really be able to see um, solutions to that problem. Of course, you're, you're still contained within the problem itself. So you have to step outside that environment to really get a perspective to help you come up with solutions on that problem. So one of the basic tools we use is around stock flow diagrams or systems models. So with these, we have various inputs into the system, in this case, birth rate, and we have various outputs from the system, in this case, people dying or mortality rates. And as our population increases, we're going to have more and more births. This is called a reinforcing loop. Of course, there's more people that can have more babies. But we also have a corresponding bal a balancing cycle where we have more, a greater population, we're going to have more deaths, simply because we have more people that could potentially die. So both of those um, loops work towards creating a model of, of that particular system, which is around births and deaths. Now, I'm just checking to make sure I haven't dropped out and you're all still here. Yes, good. So, Ask questions as we go. That'll help me then notice that you're all still here. Okay. But the fundamental problem of system modeling and of any modeling is that they're all essentially going to be incorrect at some, some level. They, they can be very useful, but until we can actually model every single atom in the universe, there'll always be an abstraction of reality. So we can never actually say for certain that our system is completely reflected in a system model. But as with any research, they can assist us in getting a, a better perspective and drawing conclusions from that. So one example here is around a supermarket where a supermarket can have a whole range of systems depending upon the perspectives of the people involved in the supermarket. From the owners, it's a, pro, it's a system for making money. From the suppliers of the products, it's a system for distributing their, their goods and receiving money from those. For the employees, it's an employment system where they go along and they receive money for doing work at that particular um, supermarket. Uh, from the, for the customers, it's a way of getting materials where they can go there, pay some money and get certain goods. Some people though, use it as an, as an entertainment system. Uh, so for teenagers or loiterers who just go there because they, they find it enjoyable to be at the mall or at a supermarket. For local residents, it might be a social system where they can go along and meet um, other residents or put up things on the notice boards and get involved in community activities. And for some people, it may even be a dating system where they go along and they meet people to um, go on dates with. 
So there can be a whole range of different purposes for that particular environment. Just as with the educational environments that you're going to be studying, your students will have a different perspective on the school system, the environment that you're going to be looking at, than the teacher might have, or the principal might have, or the local community might have, or the local employers. So everyone's going to have different perspectives on that same system. Now, one way we can think about systems is looking at the various aspects and properties within that system. And a bicycle is often used as an example of this, where we have a whole range of properties that relate to a particular bicycle. Now, some bicycles might be designed for speed. Others might be designed for robustness, say mountain bikes. Um, some bicycles might be designed to go on water or to go really, really fast and have uh, very streamlined aspects. Some might be designed for comfort um, or might be reclining. You might have tandem bicycles for multiple people to use. So almost all bicycles have some similar properties, but there'll be different aspects depending upon the needs of the use for that bicycle. So for a bicycle that has to go very, very fast, it may have very thin tires to have the least amount of resistance possible. While a bicycle that's designed for um, riding off-road, a mountain bike, for example, might have very thick and robust um, tires designed for extra grip. So the properties of that element of the system, the properties of the tires, will be different. Likewise, the properties of the seat are different for different uses of the bicycle. For touring bicycles, where people have used them for going long distances in comfort, they'll have a very thick um, padded seat that's um, more in the upright position for when you're riding the bicycle. For people that want to go very, very fast, they may have a very streamlined seat that's very light and designed to lift the body up so that you're only barely sitting on it and most of your weight is on the pedals. Any questions? Nope. Oh, good. Just checking you there. So here's a little video example of um, different uses of a bicycle. Let's see if I can just get this working. Uh, next. So again, just identifying that the same system can have different uses. <laughs> And we'll have different perspectives on that system depending upon the properties of that particular elements of the system and how it could be used by different people. Okay, so let's just think again at the idea of a school environment being a system. What would be some of the perspectives of different people for a classroom environment? How would different people perceive a classroom environment differently? So how would a teacher perceive a classroom environment? What would their perspective of a classroom be? What are the main properties of a classroom that they're interested in? So it might be whether or not the students are learning well, uh, whether or not they're well behaved and engaged with the learning. Um, yeah, teachers may think the teaching, uh, the classroom environment must be very great for students to, to learn knowledge. Yep. So that's the main focus for the teacher. Yep. And, it, and it may also be the main focus for many students, but what, how else might students perceive a classroom environment? I think students may think the classroom should be just like a playground. <laughs> they can yes. play and learn. <laughs> so they may perceive it more as a, as a uh, place for socialization or for entertainment. Yes. Yep. How else might people see the classroom environment? Who else might come across the classroom environment?
to. What about parents? How would they perceive it? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. mentioning it might be like a prison or boring and was a little bit more positive around being a safe environment for students, sometimes a more clinical environment. Who else comes across a classroom environment? I think the principal. <laughs> yes, so the principal may come across it. And yeah. how might they perceive a classroom environment? What might be their interest? I think the principal will make a list and check if the teacher has finished this task, has done this task, and uh, yes. how about the student's uh, uh, assessment, the results? Yeah, yep. just to check check the responsibility of teachers. And if so the looking at whether or not the procedural yes. processes of a school have been uh, adhered to, yes. Damien's put in a few more that parents might come across a classroom environment and they may want to be able to see what the students have been doing uh, in terms of displays and so forth. Um, other teachers might see it and, and maybe do a comparison between their own classroom environments and that particular classroom. Teachers aides um, may perceive it and then ha they'll have a different perspective in terms of how they could support that environment. And there's also support staff. But you've also got people such as cleaners. Um, they'd be interested in, in a classroom environment from a completely different perspective from most other users. So there could be a whole range of different um, perspectives on that same environment. And we're only, at the moment, talking about the physical environment. There's a whole range of other processes that could also be involved. Mm. Now, Emma mentions that they want to see children engaged in their teacher's lessons. Yes. So this is what I mean about trying to have divergent thinking around the environments that you're going to be exploring and about all the different people that and um, stakeholders that are interested in that particular um, ecosystem, as we'll start referring to it as, that um, could have some impact upon it. There may be the local employers that could be particularly interested in it. Uh, there might be politicians that are interested in what's happening in that particular environment, all with very different interests to what might be the, the teachers and the students, which would be the things we would immediately think of as being important for that particular ecosystem. Yep. Okay, let's pop back to the slides. Okay, so one of the things we look at in a ecosystem is all the constraints and choices that go into the design of that system. So one of the main constraints for a classroom system will be the size of the room and the space available and so forth. Um, other constraints might be the noise level that's possible so that you're not disturbing other um, environments. And there can be a whole lot of other constraints. It might be air conditioned or not. So there can be a whole lot of things that will influence what can be done in that particular um, environment that's, in this case, being designed. Let's go that. And this is again just going into the complexities of a bicycle as a system and all the various types of systems that are involved with a bicycle. But what are some of the other systems involved in a school environment or a class environment? What sort of things happen in a classroom that could be described as systems? Um, yes, there might be devices in terms of the computer systems and, and computers that are available in that particular space. You might have an electronic whiteboard and other aspects that could interrelate with each other. Um, yes, there, there would be various pedagogical systems in terms of the types of teaching that is occurring in that environment. Good assessment. That's one of the ones I was thinking of. The testing system that's involved in that particular um, ecosystem, how students are measured and assessed. Any others? 
uh, an administration system. Okay, well, and what do you mean by administration system? What uh, students' numbers, students' yep. scores, yep. their marks, the results, etc. Okay, yes. So that whole aspect of recording data. Re -co yes, recording data. But there can also be things such as um, attendance systems, uh, yes. keeping track of who, sh what, which students are at school. Um, yep. In the United States, in particular, they keep track of when they're moving to bathrooms and and things like that. So there's a whole range of systems involved in that aspect. There can be systems around book work, particularly if students are working through particular um, guided material uh, where they've got to go and get cards out and complete a whole series of worksheets and then yeah. record those processes. Good, Emma. A behavior system. That's a very common one in, in our schools. where We've got a system that tracks uh, student behavior and provides data on um, their performance in terms of their behavior. And a curriculum system. Yes, good. A whole curriculum system to try to track what students should be learning and what they do learn and how that's progressed through their um, studies. So you can see that in a classroom environment, there's lots and lots of systems involved. And when we explore educational technologies and we're trying to put a new educational technology into that ecosystem, we do need to consider a whole range of things that we may not consider at first glance um, in order to make that um, new innovation or new, uh, that change effective within that system. Okay, any questions as we go back to the slides? No questions, sorry, no. Okay. Okay, now one of the techniques we use um, is looking at how things change over time. And we've got lots of examples of change over time. I won't go through these in any detail, but of course weather and attendance and for young children it's more specific. But the main thing is that we can collect data on how things change over time. And once we've got some understanding of that, we can start making models of how systems work over time. And the main one we use here is, is the stock flow diagrams. And to start with, we have certain stocks. Now, stocks are things that we can measure um, or count or something that we can actually assign a value to and that that value can change. But it can be quite abstract things such as hope or patience or things of that nature, or it could be very physical, such as the amount of water in a tank or the number of trees that are growing in a field. So some examples of stocks, uh, reservoirs for water and so forth. Uh, money's obviously a popular one, air quality, populations, human populations as well. And these stocks can change. Now they can change in four different ways. They can increase, they can decrease, they can oscillate, which means they go up and down in a regular pattern, or they can remain stable. And we describe these stocks and how they change by using flow diagrams. So here the stock is, in, is the square and we have something that changes that stock by an inflow and we can have an outflow which can reduce that stock. So an inflow increases the stock and an outflow decreases the stock. And of course the common example is water in a bathtub where we have the water coming in by the faucet and out through the drain. Now, once we can identify those, we can now start identifying loops. So as I mentioned before, we had a reinforcing loop with population. Of course, as the birth, as we have more people being born, we increase the population. And then the number of population affects the number of births. If we only had two people, then the birth rate's going to be quite low. If we've got a thousand people, the birth rate is going to be much higher. Likewise, we've got, we've got a balancing loop of deaths. The more people there are, the more deaths there'll be. And the reason that's balancing is, is that if we have too many deaths, it's going to reduce the population down and it's going to then uh, balance out so it won't keep increasing. 
A reinforcing loop can increase exponentially. A balancing loop aims to prevent that exponential increase. Okay, so one thing a teacher always runs out of is marker pens. And here's a little model of marker pens in a classroom. So we have here the markers, that's our stock, the square in the middle. <coughs> the teacher brings in some new markers. And sometimes markers have to be thrown away when they're, they've run out of their usefulness. And that can be increased by uh, the number of people are leaving the caps off. But the more we use the markers, then the more that the games have to be thrown away. Um, and the more times we use them each week increases the use. The number of students we have also increases the use. But we can also get the students to bring their own markers from home, which can increase the number of added markers into the system. So by creating this model, we're starting to get a bit of an understanding of what's happening with marker pens in a particular classroom environment. More common ones are around population changes. In this case, it's a um, decreasing population of mammoths. Um, this is a famous one where they were trying to understand what was happening with uh, cheetahs. Um, of course, there was a population of cheetahs that was decreasing, and they couldn't quite work out what was happening. So they created a system model for that, and they identified that um, yes, there were certain things like poachers and hyenas and disease that were affecting the death rates. But they also identified that um, the farmers were affecting the number of poachers and um, worked out that the farmers and the cheetah habitat was an important aspect of the conservation effort. And so by maintaining particular habitats, um, and the farmers then respecting those habitats, they were able to then stop the rapid decrease in cheetah population. So this is just an example of a conservation system trying to work out how to save a particular animal species. Um, a more common one related to education is professional development. So here we have, say this is a new Say we're introducing one-to-one -one laptops. We've got a number of staff that don't, uh, don't know what to do with new laptops. We have a number of staff that do know what to do. They're the aware staff. And we have to move the, uh, the numbers from unaware staff into aware staff. And we do that by training. Um, now, sometimes, even though they're aware, they don't actually implement their change. They might know the theory about how to use one-to-one -one laptops but they don't actually uh, make any changes. Other staff do change and become implementers or advocates for the one-to-one -one laptops. And some of the factors affecting that is their motivation, the time it takes to learn things, the amount of support they're provided. So this is a little model where we could look at and try to identify what are the key things that are affecting the successful implementation of a particular innovation and start working out where we need to put more effort to have the outcomes that we would like to see occurring. Any questions on that? Uh, Jason, is, is this one just like uh, brainstorming? Um, not quite. Now, brainstorming is a very different process. Um, brainstorming is trying to get as many different possible ideas down and just identify possibilities. There is an aspect of that in that you want to build out your model and increase the complexity of the model, but you want to do that in a more structured way with uh, systems modeling and systems thinking. Um, so while, yes, brainstorming and techniques such as that can assist, um, it, yeah, it wouldn't really fall within the same sort of um, creativity process as brainstorming. But no, it's a, good, it's a good idea, but it's, apart from getting ideas to put into your system model, it's not really related directly to brainstorming. Oh. So, so this one is actually has given you the <clears throat> costs and effects and also yes. the stock, the middle part, and let yes. your brain to think about the other things which will be, can be connected in a whole system. 
Yes, you're, you're trying to use this to identify all the different factors that can affect change, um, the cause and effect aspect, as you say. Um, the, the, where this differs from brainstorming is it's, it's more systematic and you can go through and identify all the elements in a systematic way, whereas brainstorming is a lot more creative in terms of coming up with as many di um, very different ideas as possible, even though they might not relate to the model that you're actually exploring. Yeah. Okay, so as we've seen in these diagrams, there are various symbols. Um, they're the four main ones. And we try to identify feedback loops. And as I mentioned before, these can be either reinforcing or balancing. So reinforcing loops increase or compound things. So the more rumors that occur, often they can then um, generate further rumors. And you have a reinforcement of rumors. Um, where a single rumor may generate lots more. An avalanche is a good example where one small bit of falling snow then affects other snow and it has it then fall and then more and more and it just uh, increases exponentially. Epidemics are a good example of reinforcement again where one person becomes infected, they then infect two others and then those two can infect four, those four can infect eight, etc. Uh, world population is a, is a reinforcing feedback loop um, where the more people we have, the higher our population. As we can see from the graph there, uh, throughout history, our population is quite low, but we've now reached a exponential um, increase in population, mostly because we've reduced the balancing effects of disease and war. Our soil fertility can be a reinforcing uh, loop where if we keep farming too much, then the soil fertility just keeps decreasing and decreasing until it's um, infertile. Now, predator-prey is what's called a balancing loop. Um, so the more fish there are, then the more bears there'll be. But the more bears there are, the more fish will be eaten. And we get to a certain point where there's too many bears for the number of fish. And so then we see the bear population starting to die away. And once the bear population re is reduced to a certain level, then it's at a level whereby the fish population can start increasing again. And then it keeps increasing, and then there's enough fish to increase the bear population, and we have a balancing effect or an oscillating effect where we have an increase of one or the other, but not both. Uh, fire management is another one. We tend to do lots of bush clearing after there's been a big fire which then reduces the chance of a fire. But over time, we then are not worried so much about fire and the level of undergrowth increases until we have another fire again. Uh, growing plants is another um, set of loops where the more plants we have, the more seeds are produced, which then have more plants. So who can tell me what sort of loop this one is? Balancing or reinforcing? Balancing. Mm. Now, in this case, it's a reinforcing one. Reinforcing. Um, because the more plants we have, the more yeah. seeds are produced, which then produce more plants. Oh, and unless yes. we have something in there that reduces the number of plants, such as bushfires or mm. um, harvesting, then we'll have an, an overall increase. How about immunization? Is this a balancing or increasing? or reinforcing, I should say. Reinforcing. No, in this case, it's a balancing. One little hint is look into the center, and you'll see a, a B or an R. Yeah. Um, in this case, uh, the more vaccinations we have, the higher the population that is then immune. Mm -hmm. But the higher we have immunity, then we have a reduced number of susceptible hosts, which, and, or, Basically, the more, the longer we have strong immunity, then people forget about the impact of vaccinations. So they then stop getting vaccinated, yep. which then causes more diseases to occur. Once those diseases are occurring again, everyone starts vaccinating again, and we again have an oscillating balancing process. Mm. A few other quick ones. Uh, number of friendships you have. The more friends you have, 
uh, the increase you have in of inability to make friends, of course you hone those abilities, your friendship skill making abilities, which gives you then more friends and that gen then reinforces one another. Um, uh, being cold is a balancing loop. When you're cold, at a certain point, you'll start shivering, which then increases your body temperature till you're warm enough again. But then as you get cold again, um, you then start shivering again. So it, it again oscillates in that process. Now, one way of quickly identifying causal loops, other than trying to make up your own, is using a connection circle. Now the process here is around the outside, you put down all the different factors that are important for your system. So in a classroom, it'd be teachers and students and test taking and parents and everything you can think of that, that could have an impact upon your particular system. And then you start drawing links between those. So here, air pollution has a, an effect on cancer rate. Uh, the more factories we have, the more coal that's burned. The more coal that's burned, the increase in air pollution. The more air pollution we have, the increase in respiratory diseases. So you draw links with arrows between each of those. Um, and you can put a plus if it's an increase and a minus if it's a decrease. Then once you've got all those in, you can start identifying the loops. So here we have a loop where if we have an increase in economic development, it's going to mean we're going to have more factories. The more factories we have, the higher our standard of living, the higher our standard of living, the more cars, the more cars we have, the greater the economic development. And we could then take that loop out and turn it into a causal loop. And there can be many of those within your connection circle. So here's another one related to the more cars we have, the more air pollution, the more air pollution, the higher the respiratory diseases, the more respiratory diseases, the lower our standard of living. And again, another causal loop. So you can see how you can quickly build up a lot of causal loops by creating a connection circle. Okay, so that's a, an overview of systems thinking. Do we have some questions on that? Uh, I, I, I think Deming had a question for you. Uh, yeah, he just tapped into something. Okay, could you say that again, Alex? I didn't quite get that. Yeah, because uh, I think Deming has the question. Oh, because Deming, yep. Yeah, yeah, he just um, tapped into some words. Okay, and we've got Ricky join us. Um, Damien, perhaps brainstorm to get ideas first. I'll be back on that idea. Um, should we keep the systems analysis simple? Um, no. Uh, really, the whole idea of systems analysis is to try to make it as complex as possible. Um, your causal loops will be fairly simple, but you want to make your systems as complex as possible so you can try to identify influencing factors that might have been missed through more obvious, straightforward um, examinations of the ecosystem. Uh, the big benefit of systems analysis is to see linkages that aren't obvious. And to do that, you need to make it as a fairly complex um, diagram. Um, okay, I'm not too sure what feedback was related to there. Or no, they don't. Um, <laughs> Do you want to mention where those were related in what we were talking about? No, it's okay. Okay. Then. Because when you were talking, I just didn't realize that you don't see the... Yes, no, unfortunately, I'm on a single screen and I That's can't okay. see it when I'm presenting the slides. Okay. So that systems modeling at a base level. Um, Ricky, do you have any questions from what we've been talking about here? Hopefully you've been able to have a look at some of the readings and understand where we're, we're at. 
Now, if your microphone's not working, there is a chat button in the top left-hand corner that you can click on and then type things into the chat. Or you could turn on your microphone and speak to us. OK, Damien, in terms of your specific topics, uh, in the main, yes, when you come to do your systems modeling, you'll probably choose the school environment or the, the learning environment that you're going to be focusing on. And you'll create a systems model of that environment. Um, again, the main point of this is really to, uh, a bit like brainstorming, is to think up as many different uh, influencing factors as possible. So you take those into consideration. Now, some students choose to make a full formal systems model with the stock flow diagrams and all the rest. That's not fully necessary. Um, it can be useful, and we'll have a look at some of the uses for systems modeling in a second. But as long as it's giving you some assistance for the next stages of the assignment, that's what the main point is. It's not really so that you learn about how to do systems models. That's a useful tool and a useful technique to know about, but you're not going to be penalized overly for not creating a good systems model. Um, what you do need to do is come up with a process that helps you think about all the different factors involved in your particular ecosystem for your implementation plan. Um, and that can be done in a variety of ways. OK, so Ricky has done her introduction. and has only just started into the readings. Okay, so you've got a bit to catch up with in Ricky. Okay, now in the course material, you'll see that there's a whole series of examples um, to assist you in understanding systems thinking. And there's a few more little video clips there that you can look at that explain the concepts of systems thinking. And let me just bring up our bird feeder example. OK, so I'll just share again. So here's another little systems model. And this is using a tool called Insight which I'm hoping that you'll have a chance to explore in a little bit of detail. And here we've got a bird feeder. So outside at breakfast, we've got birds, and they create a pleasant morning. And as I step forward this particular model, and this encourages people to make bird feeders, which then increase the number of birds, which then improves the pleasantness of the morning. So it makes the environment nicer. Um, it can also increase the attractiveness of the garden, which can then attract more food, uh, more birds, and also increases the pleasantness of the garden and our experience of the morning. But we can have some other factors. Um, our pleasant morning can help us deal with frustrations but frustrations can detract from how pleasant our mornings are. So we've got a bit of a balancing loop happening there. Um, whoops. Uh, the number of birds at the bird feeder increases our need to buy more bird seed, which can then lead to frustration. Um, other factors that we can think about, the birds at the feeder spill some bird feed, which means we have to buy even more bird feed. But they can also attract squirrels, which can then decrease the number of birds. So we're starting to see that there's a whole lot of interrelated factors here. Whoops. Uh, and with the introduction of squirrels, we've got more and more complexities. Uh, we've got bird uh, feces being introduced. Uh, we've got rodents being attracted, and so forth. So you can see that over time, our little system of feeding birds can become quite complex. Yeah. 
So the idea here though is this allows us to simulate things. Now, within this tool, we can use it to identify the loops. So this does it automatically and it creates a big list of all the possible loops and other tools that allow us to do other things. Uh, when things are working for us, there we go. And for really complex systems, you can then actually set it up to automatically analyze and optimize that system. Now, it won't work particularly well on this one because it's not a particularly complex system that's set up like that. But if you really wanted to go ahead and make a really um, rigorous system model, such as, say, for climate change, um, you could then use this tool to uh, make a, a model that you can then compare with uh, climate data. And then you could adjust various elements of the system model to see how they then affect the model that you would ideally like to see occurring. Now, you don't need to go into anywhere near that level of detail, but it's just one aspect of how systems modeling is used. Um, so here's a few little simple ones. The shoe, stock shoe store stockroom simulation model is a nice simple one. Uh, for some reason, my screen's a little bit small. Over here. Okay. And you can actually then change things such as uh, the customer demand and the amount of shoes the factory can supply. So if I run this little system, we see that over time, okay, each time you press run, it'll go to a next step. And the amount of custom demand is equal to the amount of shoes being supplied by the factory. If, however, the factory was supplying more shoes than people were buying, we would then see an increase in the number of shoes held in the stockroom. So just a little example of a system model. Now, the main aspect of this, though, is we can actually then look at the things behind and so in this case, we see an increasing graph. And it should show us our system model here. So we've got the supply into the stockroom and the purchases out of the stockroom and so forth. So just a little model that you can use to help understand systems thinking. This one is where we've actually used a story, or in this case, a play, to look at a system. Now, this one, it's the story of Hamlet. Uh, where's the model? Okay. Um, okay. The main thing there is it doesn't just have to be a um, physical system, it could be a set of ideas or in this case, a story about um, a series of ideas. Okay, and you'll be able to have a look at these and create your own system model. Now, the flu outbreak is a very common one. Let's back to the system. Okay, here's the one for Hamlet. And here we've got motivation to kill a particular character um, over time. And it can change depending upon where things are in the story. And the various things that we have affecting is the amount of brooding, which is the, um, the motivation over time for someone to be thinking about killing someone, um, and other factors that you can look at. Flu outbreak is more common. Everyone sort of in schools knows all about flus. And here we have the number of students that are susceptible to being to getting the flu, the number of students exposed to the, to the flu, the number infected, and the number that have recovered from the flu, and how those can change depending upon 
the number of contacts the susceptible people have to those who are exposed, and the number of infected people uh, increase as the number of exposed people uh, move to becoming infected. And that can be simulated. So here again, we can change the effectiveness of vaccines and other elements in our model and run that and see here, we've got the number of um, days that students are sick goes rapidly high as everyone becomes infected. And if we were able to move that across, eventually they'd become uninfected. Okay, a few of these I've got to fix up for you and provide you with links. Um, but they just increase in complexity. You don't have to look at all of these, just have a look at a couple that you're interested in. Um, the fish banks is a fairly complex one where you run a, a company, in this case, a fishing um, venture, where you buy fishing boats and you choose where to fish and how various other factors in that ecosystem affect each other, depending upon the number of other fishing boats and the, um, whether or not fish stocks are being overfished and all of those factors that can be explored as part of understanding a ecosystem around fishing. And this is one around video games, where you've got, say, two different video game comp companies um, and how much they invest in making better consoles versus better games and how they affect each other and all the different factors that can be involved um, can be explored and modeled as a system. Okay, let's pause and have a look at some questions again. And yes, there are computer games where you can um, explore the infection processes, including some where you can actually be the person infecting and try to have as many people infected as possible. Um, and they're good, they're good processes for engaging with um, systems thinking. Other systems games are things like SimCity. Um, Civilization is another complex um, systems thinking type game. Anything that's got a whole lot of interrelated factors where you as a player can change some of those factors and see how they interrelate with other factors represents a systems-based um, simulation. Um, and when they're used for entertainment purposes, we call them games. And when they're used for other processes, we call them models. Okay, so your real challenge is to start thinking about creating a systems model for your particular um, learning environment that you want to explore. It may be your classroom, it might be a school, it might be a school system, um, it might even be a couple of students. Uh, you can reduce it down to looking at students as a systems model and the various th factors that affect a student and things that you can change and modify and then just try to think through the processes of if you do these things, these will be the, the cause and effect, um, and if you do other things. But the big aspect of systems thinking is how those factors interrelate with one another. Very often we think about cause and effect as we do one thing and it has a particular effect on what we're trying to influence. But systems thinking models allow us to think about how doing something might affect a whole lot of other things and they'll have a flow through consequential effect that may be even against what we actually want to have as the outcome. Um, and there's an example of a cat being introduced into Borneo to reduce the mouse population. Or in Australia, we've got examples of introducing um, cane toads to reduce the number of bugs or um, beetles eating our um, cane sugarcane, or we introduced a particular um, bug to reduce the number of cactuses that were being growing. So there's a whole lot of things, but they can then have a whole lot of other effects. Um, in terms of historic events, um, you could, in terms of exploring the models, Emma, if you want to just do something historically, but I'd like to see you get practice at doing this for a real environment. Of course, that's what you're going to use 
for your final assignment, part of that will be creating a systems model um, of an environment so that you can then think through all the different factors that could influence that environment. Um, but if you find it, it, it can sometimes be quite useful to explore historic events because you've got data on what should occur um, if the things flow through as um, they did in real life. And you could see if your model um, does the same thing. That's what a lot of climate science is about, creating systems model and then comparing them with the historical data that we have um, to see if those models are accurate or not. Okay, so do we have any other questions about systems modeling? The idea of these sessions is for you guys to talk a lot as well. Um, this one's a bit more like a lecture because there's a fair bit of specific content I wanted to get across to you. And I know it can be a bit abstracted when you just read it off the website. But does anyone have anything that's been confusing uh, from this week or last week that you'd like to raise and discuss? Try to now start thinking about it in terms of educational technologies. There's lots of educational technologies that we can introduce um, that can have a whole lot of different impacts and effects. Can anyone think of a particular example of that where an educational technology has had unintended consequences or has been more complex than originally thought? Yes, good. A good one, um, Damien. NAPLAN, on, or NAPLAN itself is probably a very good example of unintended consequences. Uh, the NAPLAN testing process was meant to simply provide feedback to teachers on how their students were progressing um, against certain benchmarks. Um, however, we had a whole lot of political systems that had different interests in that ecosystem and the results of that process that then applied those, um, the results of the NAPLAN testing to a whole range of other uses that it wasn't originally intended for. Um, in particular, there was a, an agenda around teacher performance measurement and then used as a process of school performance measurement and comparing schools with one another and methods of um, identifying good teachers versus uh, poor teachers. So these are things that were not intended uh, for by the original designers of that system. Um, but in hindsight, it was fairly obvious that they might be used in that way. Now, NAPLAN Online is actually an attempt to go back to the original intent of the NAPLAN testing by now making it differentiated so that not every student does exactly the same test, which then makes it harder for other um, other interested parties to use the NAPLAN results as a benchmarking process of large groups, say schools against other schools. Um, yes, there'll be some algorithms that will mark the tests and that will also have a, an effect. Um, one of the other unintended effects of NAPLAN testing was some schools that had gone to one-to-one -one laptops had to introduce um, handwriting classes because their students were not practiced at the extended handwriting required for testing um, on paper. And one of the now effects of NAPLAN Online is that many schools are now looking at doing um, not so much typing, but uh, computer familiarization um, classes so that the students are familiar with the equipment that they'll conduct their tests on. So these are all factors that can be quite significant, but unless you go through a process of systems analysis and think about all the possible influencing factors, um, it's very hard to pick up on these um, until you've actually gone through the process and made all the mistakes. So that's really what you're doing as part of the systems modeling when you come to do your own implementation plans, trying to think through all the possible consequences of what you intend doing and how the complex nature of a classroom or school environment means that these factors will be all interrelating with one another. And part of the implementation plan will be to monitor certain things to make sure we don't have any reinforcing loops that may make the processes involved go out of control. Um, so, for example, if there was a whole lot of a reinforcing loop that was making students more stressed, such as what happens with NAPLAN 
um, then that's a problem. And you might then need to introduce ameliorating factors, such as um, rotating which years do the NAPLAN tests or um, who uses the equipment and when, a whole lot of other things that you can put in place in your implementation plan that will counteract the effects of reinforcing loops in particular. Okay, any other examples of, um, in particular educational technology examples, of systems? Uh, students learning resources uh, just like uh, uh, internet resources. Um, well, yes, the the internet is a is a good system um, to look at in itself, uh, particularly as we have a greater reliance on the internet. Um, and then there's a whole lot of factors that have come out of that, such as students using it as their primary resource, um, their lack of search skills, and always going for the most um, the highest um, search ranking result, rather than delving into and critically thinking about the resources that they're exploring. Um, online cheating is increased because of that process, but then there's also the whole aspect of securing internet um, environments and having certain resources blocked and how that impacts upon the learning processes. So there can be a whole lot of systems um, involved around that and a whole lot of causes and effects that we could then explore as part of a system model. Now, Emma raises one around digital literacy levels, and yes, looking at that as a system and how we can have factors that influence the digital literacy levels of students. Um, it may be their access to resources at home, uh, it may be the use of various technologies in schools um, or their own personal uses or their prevalence of use of computer games, a whole range of different factors that could have an impact around those elements. And Damien brings up another good one around content delivery and how we actually distribute information to students. And particularly, we've got learning management systems that are designed to support that process and how that influences how students um, engage with content. But also other processes such as um, video sharing. Um, if, if, if schools have got a video sharing service in place where they can easily share material um, that's in a video format, or if they've got collections of interactive whiteboard um, applets and resources, how that can be used as a different way of engaging students with content. Or of course, you've got textbooks and the whole aspect of digital textbooks and use of video clips and uh, teacher-made video clips and so forth, and flipping the classroom and all those aspects. So all those elements can be interrelated and you can do a connection circle up of all of that and explore how they all affect one another by creating your causal loops. Yes, another good one uh, around well-being, Emma, um, and all the different factors that can affect students' anxiety and well-being and happiness, but also teachers. Um, introducing new technologies can be stressful and um, so forth. And so there's a whole range of different things that can be all interrelated. Um, the reality is you could do a, a um, system model of a school that would be almost infinitely complex because of the number of interrelated factors involved in educational processes. Um, so you, don't, you do have to call a halt to it at some point. Uh, you just simply won't be able to model uh, too hugely a, complexity, a complex model. But the more complex the model you can create and the more causal loops that you can identify, then you can start thinking about which of those factors you can then change and have the greatest influence over that will cause the greatest effect that you want to see occur. Um, that's the primary reason for it. The secondary reason is also to identify um, areas that where things could go badly wrong, uh, particularly the creation of reinforcing loops that will make something go exponential, be that well, sometimes that can be good. You might have exponential engagement, um, but more often than not, they can be negative things. Okay, so the idea is that you should try to create your own causal loop, uh, uh, your own system model. Um, there is that insight tool that you can use to do that. Don't try to make it a full um, automated model where you just click run and do a whole lot of stuff. 
just use it as a diagramming tool. And there's lots of other diagramming tools you could use. You could use Word, um, anything where you can draw circles. and, Or if you just want to do it on pen and paper and take a photo of it and share that. Uh, you can put, you could post those to our discussion board. Um, it'd be good to see some things put up on the discussion board. You can get points for putting questions and responding to things on the discussion board uh, that can count towards your first assignment task, just as participating in the video in, into these um, sessions. So I would encourage you to use the discussion board to share ideas and to pose questions and to um, share your causal loops, or your, your system models. Okay, other questions? Uh, Jason, just one question about the quiz for the unit two. So uh, we just need to use the tools provided to create a kind of uh, uh, system diagram and you, the copy the URL to uh, to the space. So yes, you, you can that. do that. Um, but if you find that that particular tool is too complex or um, involves processes you don't want to engage with, you can use other tools that can do diagrams. Um, and worst case, you can draw it by hand, take a photo of that, and upload that as a system model. OK. Thank you. Um, that's a good question, Damien. Normally not in terms of the, that activity. Uh, but if you've got any particular questions about it, I'm happy to provide you with um, some feedback. Uh, we will be looking at systems model again when we get closer to your second assignment. But, yeah, so when you post it, if you've got particular aspects about it, um, I'm happy to provide feedback there. But I don't normally, it's not like a marked assignment. It's not something that I, I normally go through and give detailed feedback on at this point. OK, well, we've gone through the material fairly quickly tonight, but I'm hoping you've got some other questions. What about from last week? Some of you weren't with us last week in terms of the readings on educational research. Do you have or educational technology research? Do you have any questions from that material? Well, thank you, Damien and Emma. <laughs> Long but a good read. Yes, yeah, sometimes we do have to have a, a bit of reading. Um, two hours to read that little bit. Oh, you need to practice your skim reading. Now, none, none of the material that you'll be getting, oh, with watching the lectures and so forth, okay, that's fair enough. Um, none of the material that you'll be asked to do the readings of, you'll be tested on uh, specifically. So you don't need to go through in incredible detail in the readings. Um, skim through it and identify the bits that you're interested in. Um, what we, what I do ask is that you read enough to be able to participate in these discussions, um, so that it's not done purely in retrospect. Um, yes, that will be one of the key aspects when we get to your second assignment is framing it around that. And for next week, we're going to be looking more in more detail at doing your Delphi study um, and some of the processes involved in that. So that's sort of where we're leading up to as a research methodology for this course. And then we'll start getting into all the educational technologies. And I've got a whole range of ebooks for you to have a look at there. Some of them are a little bit dated now, but um, we'll cover a broad range of educational technologies for those that are unfamiliar with all the different things that can be incorporated into schools around educational technology. Uh, Damien, we're going to use another particular tool uh, for collecting your data that will be more um, interactive than a survey monkey. Um, survey, doing surveys and online surveys can be very useful, but we want to use a particular process of pairing um, to make comparisons between choices uh, in our consensus Delphi study approach that SurveyMonkey doesn't really do. 
but I'll be taking you through that tool a little bit later. Okay, I'm looking at the, there are some optional readings for this week, but I won't go through those because they are optional. Um, they just take you through the whole concept of um, systems thinking in more detail. And there's a number of video clips, particularly if you're involved in the younger years, there's some good examples of grade one students using systems thinking. Um, and there's a tutorial on Insight Maker for those of you that wish to use Insight Maker to create your model. Um, but even though I say you have to use Insight Maker, I don't mind if you do, do other approaches to making your system model, as long as you do create a systems model, because um, that's in lieu of the quiz this week, and you post that up so that we can see that you've done it. And ideally, it'll be a nice complex model, but don't spend don't spend an inordinate amount of time on that. Um, you could spend days and weeks creating an, an incredibly complex systems model. That's not necessary. As long as you've got a number of loops in there and you identify them, um, that's sort of the level we're looking at. OK, well, I need some more questions. What else would you like to know about? The assignment one. OK, your assignment. Um, <laughs> I might hold off on that until next week, because I really want to introduce you to the tools. And the assignment really does rely upon the tools. It's a fairly simple assignment um, in that respect. You will have to identify 10 experts, um, which don't have to be experts, but they do have to be 10 people that will do the process with you. Um, they can be family and friends, or anyone you have. Um, I can't be one, no. Your other classmates can be. Um, but no, given that I'm marking it, uh, it's a little bit problematic if I'm one of the participants. <laughs> that was going to be my question, um, Jason, because I've got maybe, well, there's five of us um, on staff out here, so I'm a bit limited. So I was going to hope someone else could help me because, yeah, there's only five of us um, in high school. So I don't have anyone else to ask. <laughs> I do understand that. that. That's why they don't have to be experts. Um, okay. As long as they're willing to answer your questions, um, okay. they could be just just people you know. Um, okay. Hopefully, you know ten people. Um, <laughs> I know for some of our international students, that's sometimes difficult. Um, but some of our students, particularly when they come to do their full assignment, um, contact people overseas and even real life experts in the field, um, and that's certainly possible if you want to go to that extent. It's not a requirement. Um, Okay. If you were doing so they don't have to be degree. within my specific area, so I don't have, they don't have to no. be here in the same town as me. Okay, awesome. No, they don't. That's good. It would be ideal if they were all teachers. That would be certainly beneficial, but okay. even that's not a requirement. As long as they've got – as long as they can make some choices between options, um, mm -hmm. and as much as I'd, I hate to denigrate um, teaching in any way, um, as lo most people have got some interest in education and can make some informed uh, some informed decision making on possibilities where they would like to see a particular use of educational technology go. I lost some parents. <laughs> <laughs> cool, thank you. Okay, so it's one thing you could start thinking about though is your 10 people. Um, and over the next few weeks, we'll start exploring what the sort of questions are that you'll be asking them. And I'll take you through a run through of that tool and the process. Um, either next week or the week after. Okay. Uh, Jason, one more question. Do we need yes. to have a face-to-face -face interview with them or just to give them questionnaires? To No, it's all done online using a tool. Okay. And it's not even really like a full questionnaire. What they'll be shown is a series of paired options. So you might say have 10 different technologies that you're interested in working out um, what people think will be the most influential on student learning, say, as an example. And then they'll show them in pairs, and it'll be like, a learning management system, is that better than iPads? And then mm -hmm. another slide might come up, is um, a one-to-one -one environment better than iPads? Um, the idea is to make comparisons between pairs. And that tends to be a more effective process than trying to rank a series of options. Um, there's a whole range of mathematical 
techniques that are behind this approach, but it is an effective uh, research process when you're trying to develop a consensus from a whole range of people on a, a set of particular options. Thank you. Okay. Well, I've run out of things to tell you about this week. Um, so <laughs> any other questions? Otherwise, we'll call it a night. Okay, so get into, have a look at the examples, um, create your system model, and post that to the discussion forum. And then we can sort of have a look at that again next week in terms of what people have produced. Don't worry if they're not perfect, um, not expecting them to be, and there's still a lot more that you'll learn about as we go. They don't necessarily have to relate to educational technology for your example, just as long as they're a reasonable system and that you can identify a couple of um, causal loops within that system that you've created. Yeah. Um, you can do color or you can do black and white. I'm, uh, the only thing around that is if you want to show positive and negative reinforcing loops, often they're done in different colors, but you could use pluses and minuses instead if it's just black and white. Um, and yes, you can make them nice and pretty, but you may want to actually use colors as part of the structural nature. So um, having different types of elements within your, uh, your connection circle done in different colors may assist you in grouping them. Okay. Uh, Jason, one more question. Can the one we put uh, uh, in the quiz two, the same with the diagram we put in the discussion? Yes, it can be. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the discussion forum is really just so we can share it. The quiz, only I can see, um, but the discussion forum, we can then sh share and get ideas off one another and talk about them next week. Got, got it. Thank you. Okay, no other questions? Well, we'll wrap it up then, and I'll see you all again next week. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.